the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. So welcome to this series on Mary I, England's first crowned Queen Regnant, hosted by me, Johanna Strong. I'm finishing up a PhD at the University of Winchester about Mary's legacy, and this week I'm joined on the podcast by Eilish Gregory. Eilish is a postdoc at Durham University and focuses her research on Catholicism and queenship in the early modern period. Her book, Catholics During the English Revolution, 1642 to 1660, Politics, Sequestration, and Loyalty, was published last year, and she's recently had a chapter published in Mary I in Writing, which also features a chapter for me. So it has a place near and dear to my heart. Uh, And her chapter is titled Mary I During the Popish Plot and Exclusion Crisis, Memory and Catholic Remembrance. Today, Eilish will be chatting with me about Mary I's legacy in the late 17th century. So thank you, Eilish, for coming on. I'm very excited to be talking to you. Oh, thank you for inviting me along. It's actually quite nice to have a fellow contributor to chat to about Mary as well. Yes, it's very exciting. I will say we've just received our author copies and I was reading your chapter this morning (laughs) and it was, it's always nice to see kind of the stuff that comes after the period of my research. So that's exciting. Yeah, it's it's, it's a really nice varied volume actually, I think. It is, it is. I would, we're not paid to say this, but would highly recommend everyone to either pick up a copy or pester your library for a copy. So I guess even in the title, we may have some terms that not all of our listeners will be familiar with. So let's start with what is the Popish plot? Yeah, that's a very good question, especially as there's been many Popish plots for the early modern period. Um, So this specific Popish plot, for most people who do early modern history, refers to a period in 1678 when there was an alleged plot by Catholics to assassinate the king, which in this case was King Charles II, and to replace him on the throne, either with um, his brother, James, Duke of York, who had converted to Catholicism by this point, or with someone else, and to basically do a bit of a massive revolt across London and the country with massacring Protestants. And so the Popish plot is, is, is um, discussed, is pretty much in reference to that, to this alleged plot that was completely false, by the way, but obviously um, was believed enough to, to trigger this sort of outpour of horror and belief that there was going to be a Popish plot to overthrow, overthrow the king and kill him and also them as well. Yeah, it seems like there's always a plot. I look at Mary's legacy kind of in the hundred years before this period, and there are so many kind of little p popish plots. Just there's always something happening. (laughs) And then the other one is what is the exclusion crisis? Well, the exclusion crisis follows on from the popish plot. So it um, historians normally date it from either 1678 to 81 or from 1679 to 81 and occasionally even goes up to 1683 and so basically because of the popish plot and the fears that Charles could be assassinated and his brother um, be uh, replacing him with his brother being the only legitimate heir to the throne at this point because Charles had had many children with with many of his mistresses but not with his wife Catherine Braganza and so James was the, the next legitimate heir to the throne in that regard. And so the exclusion crisis was um, a massive debate uh, in Parliament, but also within literature that was published that uh, discussed whether it was right, it, whether James should be um, excluded from the throne because of his Catholicism and the fears of popery and arbitrary rule, like um, similar to what King Louis XIV was doing in France at the time, and to replace him with potentially his daughter by his first wife, Mary, um, and his his first wife was Anne Hyde, and his daughter Mary was it was uh, the next um, heir to the throne after James, and she was Protestant, and having just married the w- William of Orange of um, the Netherlands, and so there was discussions about that. And so that's what the exclusion crisis was all about: whether it, they should exclude James or whether they should put some limitations on his role to prevent any, you know, Catholicism taking over um, the Church of England um, in this regard. 
Yeah, so obviously the the monarchs, in this case kings and their consorts, are a big part of this story. Are there any other kind of big figures who feature in either the plot or the exclusion crisis? Yeah, so the royals are sort of heavily implicated in this, because obviously it transpires that Charles had, you know, potentially had some secret negotiations with Louis XIV about, with receiving money from the, from the French king. There was this, this um, Treaty of Dover um, that was signed in 1670 between Charles and Louis XIV, which is designed to create some sort of Anglo-French relationship, especially in the, in the midst of the Anglo-Dutch wars that were happening at the time. But there was a secret clause in the Treaty of Dover, which was signed, that Charles um, would convert to Catholicism and that Louis was to send troops over to help stop any potential uprisings by the king's public conversion. Though, of course, Charles II never actually converted to Catholicism until his deathbed in 1685. And this secret clause was not actually discovered until the 19th century. So even at this time, people were suspicious about the relationship, but they didn't actually know about the secret clause because it was very well hidden. But um, obviously people was were suspicious that Charles was leaning towards the French side too much. Obviously, James, his brother, had converted to Catholicism. And James has had remarried after his first wife had died. So in 6th century, he married an Italian Catholic princess called Mar- Mary of Modena. And so again, Catholic, potential Catholic heirs happening, especially she was very young and having lots of children. So, but also Catherine Baganza, Charles's wife, was a Catholic Portuguese infanta. And so you have all these different royals getting embroiled in this. And what transpires in the Popish plot, for example, is that Catherine's, um, maybe Catherine began as a staff are accused of the Pope being involved in the Popish plot, especially as, a, as a, a murder of the JP who had been told these fictitious stories, had actually been murdered by, by bad coincidence and was alleged to be murdered at Sunset House, which is where Catherine Baganza mainly resided. But during investigations initially, um, it transpired, it, it was discovered that the Duke of York and Mary of Modena's secretary had been involved in secret letters between Louis XIV's confessor. So, it, so it, it, all these coincidences just sort of came out in the public. And so people became very naturally very suspicious about what was going on with all these different branches of the royal family being embroiled with, with what be, believed be, were perceived to be Catholic plots going on. So it always seems, even though Britain is an island, it always seems like it's much closer to the continent when you have all of these different kind of political influences. And then you have all of these networks happening. And then you have kind of the staff writing to each other. It just gets so complicated so quickly. It, it really, really does. I remember when I first started looking at the Popish plot um, as an MA student many, many, many years ago now, um, John Kenyon's book um, is still the big book on the Popish plot. And even though I've got both the first and the second edition on my bookshelf, I still have to revisit it because it just gets so complicated because everything happens so much within the space of two months. You, you literally go, well, what's happened now? Who are these people that disappeared? Just because it is so complicated and just so convoluted all these things were hap- that were happening in such a short space of time. Yeah, it feels like that meme of kind of, this is how people think I look when I talk about history and it's just all the yarn connecting all of the different pictures. <laughs> yeah. And so obviously Catholicism plays a massive role, kind of w- whether true or not, Catholicism seems to play this massive role in kind of people's fears about religion and politics and the succession in the monarchy. And so I'm just wondering what the state of Catholicism in England was at the time. Obviously, the monarch is outwardly Church of England. And so kind of what does that mean for English Catholics and for Catholicism? I guess what makes Catholicism so threatening? Yeah, so Catholicism was... Te- was an Ill- was illegal at, at the time of the Pepperton exclusion crisis and had been since the accession of Elizabeth I. So Mary had been the first, had been the last Catholic monarch at this point in England, uh, up until, of course, when James Duke of York inherits the throne in 1685, just after the chapter 
covers um, in the in the Mary first in writing volume. And so what was the case that like, Catholicism had started to shrink in terms of numbers who still worshipped and identified as Catholics in this period, um, as, they, as more people started to conform to the Church of England and become and identify with the Church of England. And so they were roughly around 10%. It, I mean, numbers vary. Some people say there's about there was about ten percent of Catholics in England at the time. Other people say there's there's it's either larger or smaller than that because obviously it all depends on geographical distribution across the country. Because some counties will have more Catholics than others. So like London would have quite a bit of Catholics because of the ambassadors, chap, um, and and other householders. But places like Yorkshire and Lancashire have large Catholic numbers. But places like um, East Sussex would have hardly any, or Norfolk. So, it would, so no one knows the exact numbers of, of Catholics living in, um, in England at this point. But what made Catholicism a threat was the fact that there'd been instances when they were seen to be a threat to um, democracy at that point in time, but also against the monarchy. So, of course, famously, the gunpowder plot in 1605 as one example, and the Spanish Armada attempted invasion in 1588. And even the civil wars that had taken place between 1642 um, up, up until 1660, when Charles II was restored to the throne, um, it was believed that um, the civil wars had been triggered because of the growth of, po of promotion of popery under Henrietta Maria and also with. Um, it was the outbreak of the Irish Rebellion in 1641 when um, thousands of Protestants were alleged were massacred across Ireland. And again, people don't know the exact numbers. I mean, some people put tens to thousands, some people say it may have been less than that. But with all these instances, it meant that even though Catholicism was a minority religion, they had huge legislations imposed upon them. So if they refused to take a certain oath, they wouldn't be able to have to hold particular offices. And they could have be fined, have their property taken from them. They could be imprisoned. In extreme cases, they've been found plotting uh, or committing treason, and they could be executed. And so, this was the position that was in at the time in the 1670s that Catholicism was, elite, was illegal, but Catholicism still existed in the country, and people were just used to being fined or just being restricted from what positions they could hold in society at the time. Yeah, which makes it. I guess so much more complicated when obviously all this is happening. And then as your chapter suggests, then Mary gets drawn into it, even though she's been, I mean, to put it crassly, she's been dead for a hundred years and yet somehow she's still part of this. And so how, how does Mary and that Catholic queenship kind of get dragged into the 1670s and eighties? Yeah, indeed. And yeah, she Mary, as you quite rightly say, Mary had been dead for about 120 years by this point. So, you know, you'd think, well, what why sh why is she being dragged into this? And I think what's interesting with Mary is that the presence of Mary never completely disappears from history at that point and in the narratives and the popular myths and legends of, of monarchs had pre had uh, come before. And because obviously Mary being the first anointed queen regnant. And also the, at that point, the last Catholic monarch in England at the time, she had that sort of dual role of being both a, oh, she's a woman, but also be, oh, Catholic. And I think what's really interesting, particularly for this point in time, 1678 to 81, is that she's dragged in because she's the only figure in relatively recent history by this point that contemporaries could compare to in what potentially James could be like if James inherited the throne, because okay, James is male, and he may be a naval hero uh, before he his his conversion to Catholicism, but they strongly believe that if James inherited the throne, he would basically be another Mary, and so they believe that you know he would start burning Protestants like Mary had done had overseen in her reign, or that he would be sort of a dependent upon Spain and upon the Pope and upon Catholicism and that he wouldn't care as much about his people. And obviously this is not what we know about Mary's reign today, especially with all the revisionism that's gone on. This is just going by what people believe at that point in time James would be if 
because that's what they perceive Mary's reign to be like. And so that was their comparisons. I think that's why Mary's reign is dragged in. But I think what's really interesting and what the chapter I wrote talks about is that people for and against exclusion use Mary. So it's not just one side just using Mary. You know, like the Whigs go, oh, Mary was evil, therefore we should let James inherit the throne. There's also all these others who are on the, what we would class as Tory faction who would say, well, no, actually, Mary has some good points in her reign. And also, you know, she she was the right heir to the throne. James is the right heir to the throne. We need to, uh, you know, honour that. And so for me, that was what was really interesting, that it's, it's on both sides of the argument that people are trying to use Mary to make their point. And I, I think that's something that doesn't normally get brought up in historiography or anything like that. <laughs> Yeah, and as you say, it's interesting that this controversial historical figure gets pulled in on both sides and that both sides, I guess, agree to her relevance to the situation, but they don't agree on why she is relevant. And so just kind of looking at that, can we go into a little bit more depth into how each of those sides use her, kind of what is being argued Kind of who is saying what um, and how are they doing this? Yeah, um, so maybe if I start with maybe the Whig side of it, so they're the ones who are very, very against James inheriting the throne. So they, the, those, and obviously it would be many politicians and peers' names. So I'm not going to, I wouldn't be able to name all of them off the top of head because obviously a lot, a lot of politicians mm-hmm. and a lot of um, peers in the House of Lords. But one of the most famous advocates for, against this, for, for exclusion was Anthony Ashley Cooper, the Earl of Shaftesbury. So he's one of the really big figures who, who was against James and Harris and Fred. But there's a lot of other contributory factors about why why Shaftesbury wanted James to not inherit the throne. And I think that's been discussed elsewhere by other historians, mainly biographers, so if people are more interested maybe see the ODMB biography of him because it goes more into detail about why he had... He, put it this way, there was more history with him and James than it was about just the Catholicism side of things. But um, what Whig, the Whig faction basically argued was, obviously the stereotype, oh, he'll burn people. It'll be, it'll be like six... Um, It'll be the Marian burnings, or it'll be 1641 all over again. So this is the Irish rebellion I referred to earlier, where Protestants were massacred in Ireland in the months leading to the outbreak of civil war in 1642. And so they believe that this would basically re- be a reoccurrence. And, and obviously there were a lot of people who were still alive at that point who would remember the Irish rebellion. I mean, it was literally just over a generation or so. So about first. 30 coming up 40 years I by this point. So people would have believed genuinely that this could happen again. And so they were making lots of stere- um, stereotypes and comparisons that this would happen again if James would succeed the throne. And with um, using Mary, they were saying as well that, oh, he would, you know, promote Catholicism, he, that he would break promises because they said, Oh, Mary broke her promise to let Protestants and evangelicals to practice their religion, but she went back on her word, or that she would um, become dependent on what the clergy would, were advising her to do. And so they'd be talking about um, Cardinal Pole and other figures like that, and other people who were around in her reign at that time. And so they were making the parallel that basically James would be too dependent on these figures. Well, in comparison, the, the, those on the Tory side were arguing, well, okay, Mary had some flaws in her queenship. And again, I mean, normally alluded to the fact, you know, she was a woman, so it was a lot of gender language in there. But at the same time, they talked about things that Mary had done well, which they were basically saying that they, they could do for James. And so they talked about um, her marriage treaty with um, Spain, for example, you know, that like Philip II could only be king while Mary was alive. And that therefore he and he couldn't control all past things in Parliament. And that even the marriage had been legislated in Parliament of all these terms and conditions. So they were basically saying, oh, we could do that for James, should, you know, if we let him inherit the throne or succeed the throne, I should say. And they also talked about the fact that, you know, that Mary had done such good positive things in her reign that she had you know, found his school. She had actually paid for clergymen to be educated properly. And, they, and I think what was really interesting is that there were some 
pamphleteers, so not just politicians, there were some pamphleteers talking about the fact that, but without Mary having endowed and founded some colleges in Oxford, they wouldn't have had some of the big archbishops of the country that had come since then, like William Lord and William Jackson and, and other figures like that. So for me, that, that was always fascinating. That they were trying to bring in some positives in there. And most importantly, they talked about the fact that Mary had been put back in the Succession Act by, by Henry VIII. She was legitimate and, and, and that people were celebrated her succeed the throne in 1553. And so they were to say, well, James, even though he is Catholic, he should be welcomed in because he is legitimate as Mary had been welcomed as legitimate heir by her Protestant subjects in when she exceeded the throne. Yeah, which is always, I think, really interesting to see, I think, especially on this Tory side, the people who go, you don't have to like everything, but she deserves the spot on the throne. And that translation to, yes, you don't have to like everything that James stands for or that James does, but he is the heir. Like, what are we going to do? Yeah, exactly. And I think the the other thing that strikes me in that is just this role of sex and gender and how the main, one of the main concerns when Mary got married was just this fear that Philip as the man in early modern perspectives, he would be in charge of Mary. And I think it's interesting that there are these similar expectations put onto James, even though he's the man and would be marrying someone who at the time would have been seen as kind of the second party in the marriage and necessarily kind of inferior to him in massive air quotes. Do we see Mary's sex brought up a lot or is that just kind of glossed over and we don't really talk about that queenship aspect? Um. I think that presence is always there because they, I think the way they use the language of that is they talk about the fact that she's dependent, that she, she depends on these men for her advice and her counsel. And, you know, that because obviously, even though she is the queen regnant of England and Philip II has no jurisdiction over that, there's, you know, people still say she depended and would do things that her husband wished, like going to fight against France and then subsequently using Calais, for example, they, they, they pin that on her carrying out Philip II's wishes there, for example. And um, again, the whole idea when people are trying to back down and say, oh, well, Mary made those decisions to, to actually carry out in her reign because of the advice of her clergyman, because she depended on their, their counsel. And I think, I mean, this happened very early on, not even, not even long after her death. So like John Knox is the first blast of the trumpet for the Potter's Regiment of Women, for example, called her mischievous Mary alongside Mary of Guise at the time. Because obviously Mary of Guise was being regnant in Scotland for Mary Queen of Scots, her daughter. And so he just basically, so there was the implication that um, they were all either of sort of these women who shouldn't be ruined to begin with, but also because, you know, women shouldn't be ruling because of, you know, even original sin from the Old Testament. But also the fact that when they were taking advice, they were taking the wrong advice because they were depending too much on these male figures to, to and carrying out their wishes. And so you, you get a lot of that language there. And so it is really interesting because obviously James, as you quite rightly point out, wasn't, wasn't a queen, <laughs> um, uh, even though he was likened to be Queen Mary in breaches, which is um, something I do quote um, in my book, uh, in, in my book chapter, I should say. And um, so, yeah, it is interesting that even though he is a met, he is a man, and would have a different type of role than, than to what would be expected from female monarchs at the time. At the same time, it is interesting they want to create some sort of similar limitations to try and sort of. Um, control any any perceived disasters that would arise for having a Catholic on the throne. And so it's interesting how the debate is and trying to go back to historic precedent to try and work out what to do about the situation, given it was a very fraught, politically charged time at this point. Yeah, I can just picture if Knox had lived kind of 120 years later, 
him preaching against these mischievous James instead. <laughs> I think I, I do not like Knox, but that's probably one of my favorite phrases of his is his mischievous Marys. <laughs> yeah, it's very catchy and as well. <laughs> it is. It's so unfortunately catchy. And so what what does the Popish plot and the exclusion crisis and how Mary is, I guess, used in those, how does that affect in a lasting way her legacy and how kind of we see her in hindsight from 2022? How does that I guess, change her memory? Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting question, really, because obviously, I mean, we as we as we all know today, it, as soon as you say the word Mary the First or Mary Tudor, everyone goes Bloody Mary, or they go, you know, she burnt she burnt Protestants. You know, that's that's still if you say that today to most people, that's what that's the answer you would get. And so you probably, as as I can see, you share, you know. Oh yes. this is, yeah, it's <laughs> we hear all the time. I think what was really, I think short term legacy of after this whole instant um, Popeshpot exclusion crisis happened. James II, um, well, James Dukeville succeeds the throne in 1685 as James II, but he has a short reign because almost as if, um, as people had predicted, he made some promises, but then started packing Parliament of Catholics, promoting Catholics in the army, giving some some really juicy, good roles in politics and in Privy Council and in other roles. And so again, people go, Oh, he's he's going back on his word. That's what we allege that Mary did as well. And so James loses the throne and flees to France in December 1688 and ends up having the throne taken um, by his nephew and son-in-law, William of Orange, which is it just again shows up really bad intermarriage going on at this point, but having son-in-law and nephew in one body. He succeeds the throne as William III. And and William had married James's daughter, Mary, who was also his cousin. And so they jointly succeeded the throne as William III and Mary II. But what's really interesting, and this sort of has been studied, this has been talked a lot more by Mary II scholars, is the fact that um, Mary does get tarnished by usurping her father, because that's how, what she was perceived to be. And she was even likened to Mary the first. So even though Mary II is seen as this big sort of like figure of you know of um savior of protestantism because she was always a very ardent um, anglican at the same time she was likened to be in the same behavior as mary the first in terms of you know she broke her promise she usurped things she did this and that so it's all a lot of these negative things but obviously it's not just tie it's tying into the whole gender aspect as well because had she not been female would they have said that about her I mean, because you don't really get that much from you know, William the first big savior figure, Mary's the bad daughter. And so, you know, so it's interesting that. Um, I think over time, as we as we know, well, and, and other Marian scholars would know, that uh, Mary's legacy sort of doesn't change that much over, over time, other than, you know, she burnt people, and then you have that weak interpretation of history and sort of the, the romanticized history of of the past and so I think it's been last 20 30 years when people have really started to reassess Mary's reign and to really understand you know how contemporaries have shaped at the time shaped how we remember Mary but also what contemporaries thought about her when she did rule but also what the evidence tells us about her uh, but I think what's really interesting is that, is that despite what we know a lot more about with Mary's reign now and the initial memories of her is that this particular moment in political rhetoric hasn't really been given as much attention, which obviously is great for me because I've got to write about it. But at the same time, I think there's a lot more in there in how Mary's reign is remembered and is used as a political tool, a rhetorical tool, I should say, in how she's remembered. And because uh, obviously that, that memory doesn't ever go away and people always hark back to the past and, and to times when, it's sim when people believe it's similar. And so, obviously, for contemporaries in 1678, they just they immediately they naturally went and looked backwards to Mary's reign as her example, but obviously also seen the goodness that she did in her reign as well. You know, with the fact she founded colleges and that she was seen to bestow justice and to be 
fair in some regards, but obviously forever mired in the, in those in that moment in history with um, ordering the Marian burnings as well. So it's in, so her long long lasting legacy is one that I think still needs more revision. But I think there's been a lot more revision that's been done more recently on that. So ho- hopefully we'll get a better understanding of Mary in the course of our own careers and lifetime. Yes, ab- I hope so. Fingers crossed. Yeah, there has been such a movement. And I think it's, it's exciting to be in the movement and then to see it happening around us is encouraging and validating and also I think selfishly, as you say, very exciting because there's so much more that we can be doing moving forward as scholars in it, which I guess then brings me to a sneaky question. (laughs) Are we getting more Mary from you? Will there be kind of more Mary in the future? That's a very good question. (laughs) For the moment, um, uh, no, but it's not me. I'm not returning to her. I think just because of the new job, um, I have had to move things around like different different ongoing projects I've, that I've been working on for years on um, that needs addressing now or that I can put on the back burner for later and so I would like to return to Mary because I think there is a lot more that could be discussed with Mary and even in, in reflection of um, you know contemporary Catholics at the time so obviously I've done a lot of um, research on Catherine Baganza for example so I've got a other article that's coming out in in the next year on how on Catherine Baganza and how she was utilized in political rhetoric during the post war exclusion crisis as well and what they should do about Catherine as such so it would be quite nice at some point to actually do a comparison with the rhetoric of you know sort of merging those two together and actually go is it a Catholic issue is it a gender issue and also is it a queenship issue as well so obviously Catherine being a queen consort rather than a queen regnant but obviously both their, you know, their religions, their gender, I mean, I hate to use the word, their barrenness. I mean, I do hate using that word. But also other implications in that are sort of tied in together. So we'd be in, I would love to go and do something like that and go a lot more into the political debate surrounding both of them together at some point. So I think it'd be a nice way for me to bring Mary back in there. Um, but yeah, so hopefully in the future I will do. But for the currently... Um, I've just run out of time. I need a time turn. <laughs> I completely get that. We, we were saying before we hit record of, so how is the summer already gone? How has this happened? <laughs> well, thank you so much, Eilish, for all of your insight into the Popish plot and the exclusion crisis and Catholicism and Mary. It's been absolutely wonderful chatting to you. I will encourage everyone, go out and read Eilish's work. It is fantastic. And do pick up Mary the First in writing, um, if for Eilish's chapter alone. It is a wonderful read. As well as Joanna's. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to everyone who has listened, and we will see you back for the next episode soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.